Alright, what's up guys? Welcome to Table Talks episode 5? 4? Not even it's sure at this point. 5, four, 4, technically. This, technically this is 4. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. As always, I'm Fox, and joining me is the uh, incredibly handsome Corruption Points. I see, you're already starting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, drink, everyone. <laughs> so, um, today's topic is, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, writing your own narratives, writing your own campaigns, writing your own stuff, basically. But um, but first, before we step in, I just want to point out we have possibly the coolest fans ever, because we exclusively have this art. That's Corruption <laughs> Points as a bard. <laughs> you 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 know you've you've reached an awesome level when you start hitting uh, certain fan art. I think this one might be my favorite, right here. And uh, so thanks to uh, I think it's Capricornian and uh, Malum Gantrum for uh, for drawing these. I'll just thought that would be fun to share. And then there he is, five foot six. He's all mad. Cause that's all CP does is getting mad. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's this one, which is like strangely epic. <laughs> yeah, I like the the Prince Valiant one. I think that's the best one. Yeah, I li- I like the one of uh of you being mad because uh you're only five foot two, <laughs> or five foot six. I apologize. I'll five give, foot two. Uh, I'll give I'll give you the four inches. So uh, yeah, let's uh, let's dive into it. So this episode we're going to be focusing on you 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 know. We've been doing a lot of beginner stuff, and you know, you you've probably run a few cam- campaigns through books or whatever, you know, just to get the rules started. So now it's like, now you're just like, now I want to do my own thing. I'm comfortable. I'm a strong, independent GM who need no PCs. So, so uh, let's let's start talking about that. So, uh, corruption points. What's uh, what's the first thing you like to do when you're uh, start writing? So, um, when you're just starting off, right, and you're in your system of choice, you really need to decide on where you'd like to put the PCs. Uh, Every game that I've ever played, every game that I really know of, has many, many different setting pieces you can put them in. Whether that's if you're playing Dungeons & Dragons and you have Forgotten Realms, you have Eberron, or in specific systems, Dark Sun, or of course your own. Uh, Shadowrun has is, is the universe itself, but you can place it in any U.S. city. You can place it in European cities and things like that. Um, and Exalted actually has um, all four directions of the compass. You can have a north, south, east, or west game, all of them being completely different. And depending on the kind of game you'd like to introduce, the kind of story you'd like to tell, and the kind of uh, encounters you'd like to have, you really should decide on where that setting would be. And that's uh, really where you want to start uh, at the at the very beginning of campaign uh, management. You need to decide what you want the PCs will be seeing uh, throughout their career based on the setting that they're in. Right, and I I certainly can't stress this enough personally, but I th- I really think that you know a good eighty eighty five percent of being a good GM or DM is preparation, pre planning, you know, pre- performing you know as the other fifteen percent or and then you know the actual game is five percent. So uh, yeah, and also it's I think it's important to pick the setting because you know uh, you can mix things up quite a bit. Uh, for example, in Warhammer Fantasy, you know we we were in the Empire for for almost an entire year, and then one day I was like, hey, guess what, guys? You guys are going to Kermie, and they're like, what the hell's Kermie? And I'm like, the land of the dead. It's basically undead Egypt, and they're like, oh. <laughs> so. Um, so I mean, do you do you do you think that it's uh it's a good way to also you know mix things up as well? Yes, I think it's a great way to introduce things that your players may or may not know about uh, specifically. Um, for example, I'm playing Dungeons and Dragons Fourth Edition with my players, and this is the first time they've ever played a tabletop game aside from Dungeons and Dragons, aside from Dark Sun. So every time I introduce something to them, I get to introduce it to them, which is actually a lot of fun. Um, the first time I played Dark Heresy, uh, for example, it was the my player. None of my players knew anything about 40k, the exception of one of them. So, when, whenever I got to tell them what an agri world is, or what the the mechanicum is, or what the government is like, what nobility houses are like, uh, it was very very cool for them to sort of dive into that that feeling, and very cool for me to be able to experience it with them. Um, and that comes a lot into play about where you want your setting to take place. 
Uh, and it, whatever you think, and as a GM, you know this better than anyone else, whatever you think your players will enjoy the most is really where you should be putting your campaign. Right. Well, let, let's let's be honest. I I know you're saying that to 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 appease the fans, but you you just like to mix up the settings so you can put players in their place, right? So you can just be like, they're like, oh, we already know everything about this, and you're like, well, you're going to another place, and you know nothing, Jon Snow. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we we all know that's the real reason you do it. If they start knowing too much, you throw them into another pit to die. Well, they can know anything about the setting, but it doesn't mean they know everything about the content. Fair enough. All right. So uh, yeah, set, setting is probably the uh the biggest thing so uh all right so next thing we'll talk about is bringing players into conflict so how all right so how how do you actually start writing if <clears throat> if you don't mind me i would actually like to to go first on this go ahead please all right so generally when i start uh writing a campaign i always take the role of the villain i always sit and i think all right so i'm a powerful chaos lord i have an army like, let me think of some of what my, what some of my motives would be, you know, other than, you know, because sometimes marching into the empire is probably the worst idea ever. So let me let me try and think of some some minor plans and stuff like that to do, you know, to to corrupt and all that stuff. And uh, kind of what I've done with uh, with the uh, the Skype group, uh, Savage Worlds that we've been doing, is uh, the last game led up to a um, it it was actually a, a prelude to what was coming into the game. So. Uh, I don't want to say too much because I know there are some people who are going to be playing my grand campaign that I'm doing, but um, I like to write it from the villain's perspective. I like to think like where would he send his thugs, like how important are certain things to him and stuff like that. And you know, based on that, I kind of create encounters. I mean, is is that a bit off from what you do, or is that something? Do you kind of use similar tactics? No, I. It's this is strange, right? I don't. Um... I don't usually start my my campaigns with uh, the villain, right? Uh, for the most part, I start my campaigns with the theme of the campaign, uh, and let me allow me to explain what that means. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to uh, specific campaigns, right? I found that about four six sessions in, uh, my players will instead choose the villain that they want to be fighting, and that's through uh, either progression or growth or uh, discussion or uh, and revelations about NPCs, but they they find a concept, they find a villain, they find something that they're worth fighting for better than I can give it to them because they've decided that they want to do it. Um, for that reason, uh, I'll, I will focus more on the idea of something. So the idea of uh, Dungeons & Dragons will be that um, there's no king in the major city anymore. He died, and everyone wants to take it over. Who's going to be that person? And I allow my players to either fit that role or put themselves up to it. And, uh, in Dark Heresy, for example, the, the, the main villain's always Heresy, which is kind of silly, um, but they, uh, they were allowed to find themselves a specific heretic that they really, really hate for various reasons, and things like that. You know, I think that there's a lot to be said about um, players picking their own demons. <coughs> uh, that's, not, that's not usually something I want to try to write, although I will write villains, obviously. Right. No. I mean, I I I definitely see uh, ways of doing it. Um, I I do I do also like to kind of write you know a bit of backstory because I I was kind of explaining to you before uh, pre chat how I was like oh yeah I've spent the past two three weeks just writing backstory to my campaign I've just started writing the campaign I think last yeah this last Thursday I just started writing the campaign and where the players come in so I mean. I couldn't I, agree more there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 put, I put an insane amount of prep into my time. I like to write, you know, the stories and, you know, how how the villain's connected and what his goal is. You know, he's trying to get his goal. The players are trying to get his goal. So, you know, and how, and basically the encounters are how point A to point B happens. You know what I mean? How how does that collide together? Now, um, when, when, you, when you do this kind of uh, thing, when you create the setting, you know, and you have your bad guys or whatever. How how in depth do you actually go with this kind of thing? I mean, with with me, I, when when they're in like a city that I know they're going to be in with a long time, and there's specific key marks, specific NPCs. I literally write their daily schedule and what times they would be from X time to X time. You know when they you know release their bowels and stuff like that. You know when they take <laughs> breaks and all that. 
I mean, is, do, do you think that's a little insane for, for me going a little too far in preparing my uh, in my campaigns? That is, that's more than I would do. Uh, but I'm not going to fault you for it. Um, I think that uh, a large part of knowing your NPCs, knowing your PCs, is uh, about um, knowing how they're going to uh, <laughs> how they're going to interact with their um, surroundings, how they're interact with their environment, and when. Uh, and I, I think that that's cool. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't particularly go down hour to hour uh, just for the the idea of leeway and improvisation. But uh, I would. There is a, a, a firm benefit to knowing everything that they're going to be doing and all of their motivations uh, on a on a scheduled basis on the idea of where the the um, the campaign will be running. Yeah. All right. So um, so I guess we'll go into the next thing. So you have your setting, you have your bad guys, you have your conflict. How 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 do you pace these things? Like how how do you how do you personally? Pacing is strange. Um, your players, as I've said before, are more or less drunken psychopaths. So it's very hard for them to decide or gauge where they're going to go, what they're going to do, or what they're going to be excited in that day, that time, that week, uh, that game. Uh, and w in that, you have to really um, uh, measure the good and the bad. Um, I've said before that not every game should be stressful or serious all the time. I think having that downtime, that, le that leeway of allowing players to really just kind of be their characters for a second uh, helps. Um, on a on a session to session basis, um, I try not to. Uh, and this again depends on the on the game itself. I try not to keep it from having too many fights or having too few fights. Uh, so there are some players that simply like to fight stuff. There are players that like to play games to kill big monsters, and there are players that like to play games to be characters. And you have to really gauge which which one is important, which one will advance the story right now, and which one has not gotten enough screen time lately. Uh, for that reason, you have, uh, in a, any given campaign, or any given session of a campaign, you should have the exposition, the de decision of what you're doing that day, uh, where the, the end of the session should lead. The middle part should be what actions the PCs take, and the end part should be where they end up. Right. Um, pacing for me, it's it's quite different um, when when I write you know our, our one-off games compared to our grand campaign because the grand campaign, like a grand campaign, is a bit more lenient. I I know the players are going to be around for a bit, and you know they can do as much investigation. You know they they can say over like two hours or whatever they might not encounter any fights. I mean, do you, do you find yourself kind of giving players that scenario, or do you always give them something to fight? Do you always give them some sort of role-playing? Do you try to balance each session during a really long campaign? or uh, Yes and no. Uh, uh, I, I want to give all the players a way to do what they do best once per session. Uh, and I've, I've seen, I've played in games where I've had GMs that say, okay, you're, you're the fighter, this session is all about you, right? you're going to fight some stuff, we're going to do your things, I'm sorry, you know, Druid, I'm sorry, Wizard, I'm sorry, Ranger, today we're just going to fight stuff. And while the other three characters can fight things, right, let's move on to a different aspect. Now, we're in a dungeon that's filled with traps. Right, you, you could say to the rogue, "All right, this is the traps dungeon. Right, this is all about you. You're going to be disarming traps and blah blah blah." And then you have a fighter who doesn't really understand what he's supposed to be doing, um, and this can be done. This can be taken away by player uh, player empowerment. Right, you have uh, ways that you could always uh, include everybody. You have different aspects. If you have a trap, right, there's no reason that there can't be other things going on, and I think that's important. Um, if there's a fight, if there's an actual fight, because this is the easiest to explain in the most general example, you can have things in the fight where the fighter can run up and hit them with his axe. And then you can have things that the rogue can tinker with to make the fight go off better. Environment, traps in the room, things like that. You can have uh, uh, different settings, different scenes, where everyone gets to do the thing that they get to do the best that they can do it and make them feel good about it. Right, and and it's it's very very general to just say this is fights or not fights. It should really be that every session should have an opportunity or an event, no matter what it is, for a player to do what they do and do what they enjoy doing. Right, so that's definitely the 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 honest the honest uh, answer in this sort of thing. And I mean, I I try to do that the best I can, but then there are also some sessions where just kind of, you know, they they seem to struggle. I've 
you know, I, I've played games where you can literally play as entirely a charisma based character, and one time uh, in, uh, what was it, the last edition of uh, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, it was, the party was l- literally an envoy, a barber, surgeon, and, like, a bureaucrat or something like that. <laughs> so it's like, they, they encounter a fight, and they pretty much just, like, had to, like, find one guy, grapple him, hold him down, and then, you know, like, fisticuffs him to death, <laughs> kind of thing. But um, I, I like to I like to do creativity. I definitely think creativity is a, uh, a key part in the, in sort of things like um, you know if if you got the big burly fighter or whatever you know they're they're interrogating someone you know the, the fighter would be like can can I just look menacing I'm like yeah you can try and I'll allow him to make a check it's like yeah you look menacing even though you're technically not a part of the actual you know conversation role play you know you're being useful because you're sitting in the corner just kind of giving him the stare down. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, that's it. You know what I mean? Like, it, just because there are skills that are applicable doesn't mean everyone can't be doing something, or, or doesn't mean there's not a an opportunity for everyone to be doing something. And as GMs, we need to give them that opportunity. Uh, it's it's very easy to highlight um, specific p- players. It's very easy to main character somebody, um, but you should, uh, as GMs, we should really um, give out uh, equal opportunity to all players. Right. So, okay, we're we're kind of we're kind of actually breaching into our next topic. So, when we're doing a uh, you know a, lo- a lengthy campaign, how 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 do you b- balance you know combat and narrative? It it's I'll 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 take I'll take the first one on this. Please do. <laughs> All right. So, generally when I start something, I I make the the goal clear. I say, "Okay, this is exactly this is exactly what needs like this is this is your goal. This is the thing that needs to happen. They say okay, and how they get there is totally up to them. I mean, again, I would love to talk about this this campaign I'm writing, but at the same time, I can't. Um, but but the way it works, I almost kind of let the narrative lead into combat because if they go off and do their own thing and they kind of you know going are are going on bad leads, you know, to find a gang or something like that, they're not going to find the gang if they're if they're going on bad. Leads, they're believing the false information they're being given and stuff like that. But at the same time, they know if, when they're failing, they're like, "Oh man, there's something that we must be doing wrong." And you know, it really encourages them to think more, and it you know, it creates a more interesting narrative and stuff like that. And then they have to backtrack their steps. So I mean, when okay, so I guess I guess to, to backtrack in our last conversation as part of pacing, I like to make my players go look for fights. You know, it's it's simple enough for you know. A bunch of bands to kick down the door and be like, "Hey, we don't take kindly to your kind around here." And then one person's like, "No, Skeeter, we don't want no trouble." Like, no. <laughs> but um, I mean, what 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 do you do for combat versus narrative? You look like you're about to explode. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, for combat scenarios, right? Um, I will always give my players a way to get themselves out of it. Right, and uh, I've I've actually had a discussion with the player about this before. I put them in a Kobayashi Maru where no matter what they were going to lose in some way because I wanted them to gauge like which which is the worthy sacrifice, which is the least amount of sacrifice. And my most combat ready, optimized like super ninja decided that he was going to talk his way out of it, and it just blew my mind straight to pieces. Right. And uh, so I talked to him after the session. I was like, man, that was the best thing I've ever seen. Like, that was so cool. How did you do it? And he said to me uh, uh, something that I'm going to carry with me for, like, the rest of time, which was if we fought, we would have won something. But if we decided – if we found a way that wasn't fighting, we would have gotten everything. And I was like – I just couldn't – I couldn't live. It was done. It was over. Uh, in, in that, right, I always want to give my players the option to fight or not fight. You know, I want them to give to give them the opportunity to do anything that they could possibly do in the situation that isn't just fighting. I want them to take hostages. I want them to talk their way out of it. I want them to use the environment. I want them to run away because if every fight is just a fight, it gets a little bit much, uh, and it, it very much stifles um, those non-combat players or combat players to creatively expounding their characters. Right, and I mean, if if someone were to talk their way out of the scenario, do you give them? Would you give them full experience for that? Absolutely. Like as if I they, give them as, more experience for that. Yeah, yeah, I definitely like to give uh, experience for that. So I mean, trying to trying to think. Wow, 
brain fart. That means you drink. That's that's my drinking rule. <laughs> is every time I have a brain fart. But um, combat versus narrative. So I mean, I always try to make everything kind of tied to the story. Yeah, random encounters are kind of weird. It's you know, it's not like they're walking through tall grass and then a rat tap appears and they're like, oh, we gotta fight the rat tap. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but um, I I like to, I like to make every everything have a uh, have a story. Um, okay, I, I guess I will give a tiny bit of. Okay, you know what? Jamie, Brett, Amanda, uh, Toxic, Drix, if you're watching this, please put this on mute. I will give you the swan symbol when it is okay to to watch it again. But um, one one of the things I have that will always be an encountering fight for the beginning is um, there are these uh, mysterious blue cloaked strangers that constantly wander the city and just kind of scout out like they're looking for something. They can't talk, you know. They they might not even be human. But they're always going to be wandering around the city. So if players are looking for a fight to see if they can try to get leads off these these strangers. You know they can fight them, but at the same time they can also choose to avoid them because they're also going to be fairly dangerous. They're very unusual. So I mean, do, do you ever do you ever have anything like that? <laughs> <laughs> nice swan symbol. Um, it, yes, you know, and it's. It, I really I like to uh, assume that I give my players the most options possible all the time, and that's really all we're talking about, you know. Um, even in a combat, even in a narrative, as long as they're progressing the story that they want to progress in the way that they want to progress it, we're doing our job correctly, and that's it. That's all there is to it. Like, not everything has to be a fight. Not everything has to be narrative. And you can roll your dice however you want to roll your dice in and out of combat. Yep. And once again, you know, it's your story. You know what I mean? You shouldn't force anything upon yourself. You shouldn't force anything upon your players. Because the game's all about having fun. Right? Yes. Rule number one, GM's always right. Rule number two, yes. have fun. Have fun. <laughs> so, uh, do you want to move on, or do you have do you have more to say about this? I think I'm set. Uh, it, yeah, I think I'm set. You think you're set? All right, so this is, this is one you actually suggested to me. So, uh, I'll have you start Milestones. Yes, okay. Um, so, I've said before... The players are drunken psychopaths. It's very hard for them to, uh, for you to gauge what a player is going to do, why they're going to do it, when they're going to do it. Uh, the law of players states that players will do exactly what you don't want them to do, exactly when you don't want them to do it, as often as possible. And as GMs, we have to we have to contend with that. All this prep that I just did out the window. All these notes that I just took doesn't matter. My GM, my players are going to Planet Q when I really wanted them to go to Planet B. And how, and if you, when you're telling a story, that makes it three times as hard to tell a coherent story, especially if they want to do something you have not prepared for in your story. Uh, and for this, I I uh, attune myself to something I like to call milestones. Right? It's not particularly specific things that I want my players to see, but it's things that my I know my players will get to. Um, and allow me to elaborate. Uh, I know for a fact that uh, if I tell my players to go into a dungeon, they're going to spend about five hours deciding whether or not they want to go into that dungeon. <laughs> and, and there's no more, no less, it'll be five hours of discussion and preparation of whether or not they're actually going to go into that dungeon. It is my job within this five hours to make convince them that this is the best option for them. Not the only option, because then they'll absolutely not want to do it, but the best option. And that's the difference between um, forcing and leading. You have to lead your players to convince them that this is the best possible avenue of uh, action they can take, rather than saying, you have to go to the dungeon, because they'll find anything that they can possibly find to weasel their way out of going there. Now, now, uh, now how, how, how do you handle that exactly? I mean, when I... When I, when I think, you know, you gotta try and convince them, I think bribe. I think there's something <laughs> cool down there. There's a shiny thing that will give someone power. And then they're like, oh shit, let's do that. <laughs> you know, do, do, do you have another an, another way to do it when you absolutely want? Uh, narratively, it depends on the, on the characters themselves. Um, I could say any amount of things to any amount of players to make them go into a specific dungeon, right? If I say that to one guy, 
who's uh, got the hots for an, another another uh, NPC. If I say to this guy, she's in that dungeon, you gotta save her. You gotta get in there and do it. He's gonna be like, yeah, absolutely, I'm gonna go be the hero, blah, blah, blah. And then I'll have that female NPC be nowhere near that dungeon, because why would I do that? It has everything to do with uh, convincing my players that something is going on, whether that be uh, NPC lies, or whether that be NPC truths, or that be personal motivations. You know, it, it it's not always about, like, there's the best sword ever in the bottom of that cave. It has to do with um, whatever you want, whatever you need for your character will most likely come to fruition should you get there. And I, and I specifically mean those wordage. It's should you do this, you could possibly gain that thing that you really wanted to do and achieve. Right? And then so my player will have that at the forefront of their mind. They'll think, oh, great. You know, if I, if I go there, I'll be able to achieve this uh, task that I've been wanting to do. Or I'll at least have a better benefit of doing it. And that's that's the important part, right? And uh, one one thing that I've actually been kind of struggling if, with is um, one of our players for our Savage World campaigns is a Wood Elf. Now I know you're probably not familiar with fantasy lore, but Wood Elves basically don't give, you know, two 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 dams, two coins about uh, anything that goes on in the the Empire. And this this person who's in our chat room, she plays a very very. <laughs> She plays a very, very convincing wood elf as far as personality and stuff like that. And, you know, I, I, I love her to death for it, but at the same time, I'm just like, oh my god, this is making it so tough. Why the heck would you even be here to begin with kind of thing? So, I mean, I, I, I can kind of understand that. And I guess, again, that's that's bringing players into conflict. How do you get them to to tie into that story? And, you know, there's there's no right or wrong answer, but... You, know. you could always, you could always, uh, because she's playing a character with much hubris, right? You could always, uh, uh, what I'm looking for, you could always uh, generate towards that hubris. Um, it's just because she's a wood elf, and because she thinks that she's the best wood elf in the universe, because all wood elves do, right? You can very easily say, like, oh, these puny humans will have no possible way of achieving this, and you need them to like, continue to be able to uh, accomplish your goals, so I guess you have to go along. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it it worked it worked well the first time, and I'm looking forward to uh, to uh, actually tomorrow's game. If uh, yeah, I guess I guess announcement. We're going to be live streaming team, team England's second game before we uh, move on to the grand campaign, which should happen sometime early June. So uh, very very excited for that. If you guys want to hang out, uh, I believe we're going to start rolling dice at uh, 11 a.m. my at East Coast time, and uh, <laughs> we'll see we'll see we'll see how that goes. That could be fun. So, okay, so ultimately, is the milestone getting them into the dungeon, or is it part of your, your quest to have them complete the dungeon? Ah, okay, so the milestone is not getting them into the dungeon. That will happen whether or not they want it to happen, and it may not happen dependent upon the player's interests, right? Which is important for GMs to understand. I have thrown away so many dungeons because my players just simply do not get there or they die on the first level or they decide to leave halfway through and that's something we all have to just accept and move on with. The thing that we need to understand and the thing that we need to uh, really, really generate towards is getting the story moving dependent on what actions they take, right? Again, if I'm giving them a reason to go into that dungeon, I want that reason to be accomplished by the time that they leave that dungeon. And in that, right, it's a matter of finding what I want them to do, finding why they're going in there, and finding why they're leaving. That way, no matter how much of it they see or explore, and that's again dependent on their motivations, they'll be able to continue the story that I want to continue. And if they don't get to the thing that I want them to see, if they don't get to the thing that they want them to see, I can use that later in the story. You really could have stopped that arc lich from rising if you had only found his phylactery when you went to the deeper into that dungeon, but I guess you didn't. Roll for initiative. And it's that it's that simple. You uh, everything milestones are about making everything that the player does meaningful and important, and bring them all into the story. Not focusing on one specific event that you want them to do, but focusing on the grand milestone of where you want them to be. Right. Okay. So uh, I guess uh, moving on to uh, rewards. So obviously this this kind of falls with pacing, and you reward players different from a one-off game to a grand campaign. So how how do you how do you reward players? Because I think we have two different ways of doing this. 
I, I think that yes, uh, <laughs> probably. Uh, I'm going. I start with uh, experience first, obviously, right? Every every player gets experience at the end of the, the session of the campaign, depending on what they've done. Um, and it's it's a matter of that's general like progression. Congratulations, you are now moving forward with your character. When it comes to specific players, I like to reward specific aspects. Uh, when I was playing Shadowrun, I had a troll who really wanted bionic arms. Uh, and just like replace his arms with giant awesome bionic arms and he did and that that was something he paid for and he paid for with like in-game money and things like that and he decided that he wanted one of his bionic arms to have more or less explosives in it right so he could he could grab something and just explode his face and I was like that's the coolest thing I've ever heard but you gotta work for it how are you going to do this and uh, through a series of actions he took to gain money and find that technology and link up with a corporation, he was able to put like his explosive hand on, and I thought that was the coolest thing in the universe. Um, I like rewarding players for doing the work that they want to do to get the thing that they want to get. Mm-hmm. And it and it's it's that nuanced. It has to be about um, making the player work for what they want. Right. For me. Okay, so I, I guess that's kind of similar to what I was talking about, because I mentioned this in a previous episode, I'm not sure if it was the last one, but I like to use my, my imaginary currency called brownie points. I've, I've discussed this, do you, do you remember how this works? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, 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 like, I like using brownie points, for, I mean, anyone can, you know, go to, to, you know, a weapon store and be like, hey, what do you have for swords? And then it's like, well, I have plenty of swords to choose from, you may choose whichever one from this much gold. But at the same time, you know, I also like to to give role-playing perks and stuff like that. Like, uh, for example, Toxic's character. He he really wants to become a witch hunter, you know? He's he's actually already worked for it. He's technically exchanged some of these quote-unquote brownie points to to begin his initiation into the uh, into the uh, family that's a bunch of witch hunters, and he has this little RP badge he can he can wave around, you know? Maybe, uh, maybe one time, you know, halfway through this grand campaign, you know, tales of his... Uh, his character's wisdom go through, and he receives, you know, a package, and there's his there's his witch hunter attire right there. He didn't have to buy it or anything. It's just saying, hey, good job, because not only am I saying good job, the NPCs are saying good job. They're saying congratulations, welcome to the family, bro. You know, and those those are the kind of rewards I like because I like I like a lot more progression to go on definitely because in the one-off games it's just like okay, you get some money. You know, you get some experience, that's cool. But I really like to show character progression. And you know what? I might even overdo it sometimes to an extent just to make them, them feel like, hey, like you, you've actually been doing some pretty big stuff to, you know, affect the world, so here you go. I mean, is, is, that, is that too much progression, do you think, for, no. for a one-off campaign? Not at all. I, it, it depends on how long you want your eventual campaign to be. Um, but I don't think you're doing it incorrectly whatsoever. I, as a GM, am very, very... Uh, I, I'm tight-pursed when it comes to giving out stuff. Um, because I know I know how long my campaigns are going to be. I come into them with the idea that this campaign will be 12 sessions long. Or this campaign will be 16 sessions long. And that is it. At 16, it's over. Which means I have to get from where I started to where I finished within 16 sessions. And if I give uh, everybody a Vorpal Sword at session 3, then we're done. You know, look at this. But the rest of it will just be the silliness, um, and that, that's not at all what you're doing. Um, but it's it's a matter of uh, I personally like to very much limit my players and what stuff they get, depend incredibly upon how they work to get it. And uh, again, in one offs, you don't know how long your sessions are going to be, how long your campaign is going to be, if this is the last one ever. So you want to give them, you know, the biggest benefit, the biggest boost you could possibly give them right off the bat. Uh, to make them feel super engaged and super into their character. Right, okay. So, uh, anything else you want to talk about in uh, rewards? Mm, as far as uh, campaign rewards go, no. Alright, so one thing that actually I forgot to mention is let's talk about the use of NPCs in grand campaigns. So, okay. So, I'm, I'm, I'm trying something a bit different. I've tried it in the past, and um, I think I want to talk about it a bit. This isn't a spoiler. You guys can consider this who's a part of the Grand Campaign as, you know, as a, a preview to it. Um, I really like the idea of having just kind of an NPC to just kind of hang around. <laughs> oh, that was nice. Was that a yawn? <laughs> Possibly. Um, man, what was I going to say? Oh, so, so yeah, I like the idea of having an NPC who kind of, you know hangs out with the players, whether he's, you know, a veteran soldier or he's kind of a diplomat. 
Um, I have a, I have, think I have five NPCs that I have planned, and when players go off on the adventures, because I kind of explained to you how I'm planning to make this work, when when they go off to do their missions, they say, hey, we can take one person, or you know, they can take two people if fewer people show up, and they give them these little perks. So, for example, I'll give the Empire Merchant. You know, he's he's a really smart dude. He knows how to handle his money, and one of the things he can do is if you know they they enter a a bartering scenario. Whether they're either you know robbing someone or they're trying to uh, to get a discount off weapons. If he's in your party, he you know he's a brilliant merchant, so he can talk down prices and stuff like that. And, um, you know, they can get extra money, and he's also an investor too. So one thing I like to have is he's he's hanging around with you know the players or whatever, and he says, hey, if you give me some money, I'll invest into something cool. And you know, he might come back with something lame. He might come back with something totally cool. So I like this idea of the players always have these NPCs to fall back on, because then, of course, they can also ask them for advice, which can kind of be my voice within, you know, if they're absolutely stumped on something, like maybe I I, I didn't explain well enough, and, you know, he can be like, well, what do, you, what do you think, you know, NPC? And he can be like, well, I'm trying, he's like, well, I thought this was important, of course, I'll also put it in character, too, because certain, peop- certain NPCs will think certain ways. So, I mean, do, 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 you, do you include NPCs to kind of Almost, I don't want to say handhold because handhold is kind of a negative term. But do you, do you do anything like this? Like have an NPC that kind of is just always on the players' sides, no matter what. Yes, uh, I have said this many times. I am a character writer first, and everything else second. You know, I I will put NPCs by the truckload into my campaigns uh, to 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 uh, advance the story, to advance progression, to show PCs how they should be reacting to the world, to give them something to love so I can kill them in front of them later. I love giving out NPCs. I love it. It is really one of my favorite things to do. And when it comes to... I really like the idea of the NPC investment. That's pretty cool. Um, When it comes to uh, NPCs guiding or rewarding or leading the players, I do all of that, yes. And uh, a large part of my process is not every NPC is going to tell you the truth. And not every, every NPC is going to be your best friend. There probably will be one, but I wouldn't trust everybody. And my players have come to uh, sort of know and accept this. So anyone with like a cool name, probably a villain. Uh, anyone that starts <laughs> off like a normal person, probably a good guy. You know, like, <laughs> uh, they, they met a game a little bit. But the idea that NPCs are, are, are something you can use as a GM to lead uh, the players anywhere you want to go to, to bring them out of the fire if they sort of get caught. Uh, I love that. that. That's something I do very often. Uh, it, again, depending on set, on the the uh, game itself, but it's something I do um, most of the time. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm actually really looking forward to because I also I basically have two benefits. I have kind of an in-game uh, combat or diplomatic benefit. So his is he can give you the uh, the uh, discount or he can. Um, he can, he, you know, again, if you're robbing someone or something like that, he can tell you where he's hiding extra money and stuff like that. He's like, check the floorboards or something like that. Or check under the candle. He might be hiding coins in there or something like that. And then, you know, his 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 out-of-combat thing, just for having him hanging around in the tavern, he has that investment option. So if players just have an abundance of gold, and they're like, yeah, let's see where this takes us, they can give him some gold to see what he'll come up with. And then, then I have a negative thing which is he's also a coward, so if somebody intimidates him, he's so jumpy and makes everyone uneasy, so everyone gets a negative mo- uh, one uh, modifier to any sort of intimidation check that's put towards anyone in the party. So uh, I also like to make it strategic, because I have, like I said, I have five different per- people, and then there's the Bretonian character who's going to be a you know, six-foot-three tall muscly Bretonian with giant sword on his back, you know, he, he gives he gives the benefit of, he allows everyone to uh, re-roll fail hits in, like, close combat or whatever, because he's a tactician, you know, he's a veteran of wars, and stuff like that, and, you know, his his out-of-character thing, and I think we've discussed about this before, is um, if players talk to him and they're friendly with him, he'll say, hey, you know, I'm from Bretonia, I could teach you how to, like, ride horses, and, you know, how, how to master riding, because that's a skill that, you know, a lot of players think kind of in the last thing, but at the same time, they're like, oh, I want to be friendly with this guy, because he can still train me in that skill that I kind of didn't want to put points into. Yep. And then, then, of course, his negative thing is he's also, I, I think I have it quoted as head in the drink, which means he's totally sexist and racist to anyone who's not a white dude. Because <laughs> he's from Tony. But, um, I mean, that's 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 my extreme uses of NPCs, and these 
these char- these characters will also have their own tie into the story, and based on how much players like or dislike these characters, I can totally sway the story however I want. Yes. Yeah, yeah and, and there's nothing saying that NPCs can't be the story, right? And uh, that, that I think that's something that most GMs kind of shy away from. Um, it's uh, the idea that there has to be this grand arcing campaign isn't particularly true. This is the story of the players, and what better story is there than growth? Uh, growth with your friends, growth throughout time, and realizing what loss is. I love killing things in front of my players. I really, really enjoy it. As much as it makes me sound like a sociopath, I firmly enjoy uh, making my players cry after I kill their best friends. And that, in that, right, um, it's... If I can gush for just a second, uh, I was uh, recently playing a game called Earthbound for the Super Nintendo, which taught me a lot about my design process. And in part of that game, you meet, a, you go to this magical dream world where you're more or less yourself in a dream, and you meet your courage, your courage personified as a little bird person that follows you around. And every single time that one of those little bird people dies, your courage dies. And you have to go visit their grave and says, here, here lies your courage, it fought bravely. And every single time I'm playing that game, I'm like, oh god, my courage is going to die. And then it dies because it happens. There's no way to prevent it. And I feel awful every single time. Every time it breaks my heart. And if you like lose all of your flying bird men and all of them turn into little gravestones, it says all of your courage has died. And that's like the most terrifyingly sad thing to ever hear. Here. And I'm like, geez, why would you do this to me? But I realize that I take that into all of my games. And as I take like your friends and like they're gonna save you, but it's the end of them. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, all of your courage is dead. It's just you left. What are you gonna do? You're gonna keep going, you're gonna quit now. Yeah, um I, I just I just got feelings for two of the companions because I the the dwarf character, she's probably she's probably my favorite companion that I wrote for, for her and uh yeah, her her story is is quite sad, and I won't say too much about it. But um, one of the benefits I actually have for the high elf that they meet his his thing is actually if a player falls and he's in your party, he'll literally defend you to the death. So he will literally give his life. So he could actually die at any given point if the players screw up in combat, because his whole thing is he's a guardian, he's a protector, kind of thing. So yeah, I I I agree. I totally love to to kill anything that my players love. Kicking the dog. Kicking the dog is the best trope ever. All right. So, um, yeah, we made good time on this. 42 minutes now. So anything else you want to say about uh, writing your own stories? Uh, No. The best thing you can do is start doing it. Don't be afraid. And that's all you need to do. Yep. You have all the time in the world. You know, you can start doing it as soon as you start understanding the... In fact, you don't even need to understand the rules. You You don't. You can even take one of the stories you wrote in your spare time and haven't shown your friends, and you can be like, okay, what if my players were my main character instead? You know... It's 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 fun. Even if you never play the campaign and you write a campaign, it's still a lot of fun. I I do it all the time, and I've been I'm probably gonna start doing it a lot more than I have been in the past. So yeah, if that's our uh, final words, I guess I'll say it. Uh, Dice Troop is a nonprofit organization. We have a donate button on the bottom of our Tumblr blog. If you have a dollar, two dollar, five dollars, twenty dollars, anything you can, that would be great. We'll still give the shows for free. Just any that you donate to us uh, helps us uh, keep running the show. In fact, it's quite nice because uh, we got enough donations that I'm actually not losing money from doing this anymore. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, what, what, you, you have an announcement as well to make? Oh, yeah. Uh, so soon I'll be starting a, a very specific and very strange kind of game where I run uh, improvisational systemless games with uh, you all. Uh, I have no idea what the title will be, what the schedule is like, but uh, there is a post about this called The Crusher Points Adventure Game on my blog if you'd like to read more about it. Yeah, and you'll be doing that on the Dice Troop channel, correct? Yes, that all will right. be on the Dice Troop channel uh, eventually. <laughs> All right, cool. So uh, we got we got a lot of fun things planned this summer. We got the uh, the super secret project that uh, I informed Corruption Points about, and uh, we're in the works of that, and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Possibly two, three new shows coming out this summer as well. And uh, we got Planeswalkers Mosh Pit. We're probably it's it's weird doing a magic show because it's just like what exactly do we talk about? So we we kind of we kind of wanted to do it this week, but. And it didn't really happen because we're like we're not really sure what we want to do, but uh, hopefully we'll be doing that. You got the hammer Sunday, and uh, I don't think we, there's any uh, fluff talk or black vault this week. So yeah, with that said, uh, we'll be back for uh, post show chat, and uh, thanks you for watching once again. See you later, guys. <laughs>